So, so some of my favorite people in the world are Mike and Lauren Love, a part of Momentum. Mike is one of the elders at Momentum. Lauren is our part-time student ministry director, uh, leading and working with students, middle school and high school, and adults that work with those students. Uh, they have two little boys, Luke, who was born about three and a half years ago in August of 2017. And then just over a year ago, the cute little baby James, uh, born in November of 2019. He's 13 months old and just adorable. So three and a half years ago when they had Luke, uh, my wife Shannon and I were pumped to go visit them in the hospital. And uh, we were excited because we had been praying for them to be able to have a baby. And, and so just like, God, I don't know why you answered all of our prayers, because they were praying too, but thank you, God, that, you know, the loves got to have a baby, and, and, and went to the hospital, and I was excited to find out his name. His name was Luke, because the whole time I had been praying, since they got pregnant, and we pray for Mike in our elders meeting, and I pray for them at home, you know, from a distance, and just aim in their direction, and stow, you know, just aim and pray for them, be like, dear Lord, Please bless the love child, because I didn't know his name, so I just called him the love child. Bless the love child. Help him be healthy. So I was excited to go to the hospital and find out, oh, the love child. His name is Luke. And so learned his name. And uh, so we get there, and, and one of the things I loved was hearing their story um, about Luke's birth and all that. But one of the things that was clear is that they were exhausted. They were so tired. Now, that comes naturally with a first child. If you've ever had a child or have children, the first child is shocking how tired you are. Like the waking up at all hours of the night and the next level, like you thought you were prepared, you weren't prepared. It is so exhausting. So the fact that it was their first child, that alone is exhausting. And also Lauren went into labor on Sunday night at really around midnight. And so she woke Mike up. She was like, it's happening. We got to go. They went to the hospital. They got checked in. She pushed for three and a half hours. Nothing. So they wheeled her in for surgery, C-section, and then there came baby Luke. So that was at about 11 p.m. Monday night, and then at 1 or 2 a.m., which would now technically be Tuesday morning, they finally were taken to a room where the three of them together could rest and recover. So by this point, Mike and Lauren Love have basically been awake for 24 hours. And this isn't just like, oh, I happen to almost be awake 24 hours now because I got up early, stayed up late. No, this is stress, getting to the hospital, pushing for Lauren, surgery, all this stuff going on. Now, important side note, Mike, I love Mike Love. He's on the elder team, good buddy of mine. I love this guy. It's hard to find a guy you will like more than Mike Love. But one fact about Mike Love is, he is a guy who needs his sleep. He does not function well without sleep. He's a creature of habit. To bed by 6.14 p.m. every evening, you know, uh, eats like he's in a nursery home at 4.30 p.m. No, that's not all true, but it's an exaggeration. But he is a creature of habit, and, and if he stays up too late, he can be a wet blanket. And so, in the hospital, in the middle of the night, baby Luke in their room started crying. Well, in the hospital, they're very helpful, but in the middle of the night when you have a baby in your room, they're not super helpful. And all Lauren needed, who had had surgery, and that incubator kind of crib thing is just out of reach. Well, nobody's just running to the room be like, hey, let me bring your baby a few feet over to you because maybe your baby's hungry, it's crying, whatever. And so Lauren needed help, so she started to wake Mike up, and um, that's a problem for Mike coming from a dead sleep. So she wakes Mike up out of a dead sleep, and she says, Mike, give me the baby. And so Mike gets up, and he's as groggy as can be. And he walks over, and he gets like a receiving blanket. He balls it up in his arms. He goes to the incubator, and he reaches down, and he picks up an imaginary baby in his hands, and he puts it in his arms, and it's really just the receiving blanket. And then he zombie walks over to Lauren, and Lauren says, Mike, you don't have the baby. That's, that's not Luke. You don't have the baby. And so Mike looks real confused. He looks down at the blanket. He walks back over to the incubator. And he reaches down. And he picks up another air baby. And he puts it in his arm. And he starts walking back to Lauren. And Lauren says, Lauren. Lauren says, no, Mike, that's not the baby. That's not Luke. You don't have the baby. Real confused now. Still not out of his funk. And so he walks back over a third time. He mimes reaching down, grabbing a baby, maybe situates his head a little bit, holds it like a football, like Trey Sermon in the Big Ten game. And he 
head. And Lauren's like, no. And at this point, Lauren's like, I'm not sure that I want him to handle the baby now. Okay? This is ridiculous. But the fourth time, he goes over and he scoops up baby Luke. And he brings him over and he's like, one day you will write a gospel. The gospel of Luke. And he hands to Lauren and she takes him in very wisely as a mother, she said. And from that point on in the night, I just kept the baby in bed with me because I don't want my groggy to husband to touch the baby. Mike, you don't need to touch the baby. And so this is the truth about what it is like to, to have a baby in the hospital. And if you see Mike in the hallways, he's here this morning and he tells you any different. No, I just carried an air baby one time or two times. Trust me, he's not a credible source. He didn't know what was going on that night, all right? But this is the truth. The birth of a new baby is absolutely amazing. Whether it's yours or someone you love, it's so cool, but it's also exhausting. But eventually you look back, even in the midst of that fatigue, I know me and Shannon look at pictures after we had our firstborn Zion. In the first few days, there's this picture of us on this fake pleather couch you know, it's like leather, but not real. It's like plastic, so it's pleather. And we're sitting on this couch, and we're just sitting there holding the baby. And anytime we see those pictures, we're like, man, we were tired. We look 82 years old in those pictures, and we're like, you know, 30. And so it is exhausting. But you look back on those memories, and you treasure them, even though it was exhausting. So today, we're wrapping up a series called The Art of Christmas, where we're looking at one Christmas painting each week. We're looking at the correlating passage of Scripture with it, and we're just saying, what does that mean to us, or how could that encourage us? And I hope that this message today is an encouragement to you. It might feel like a little bit weird on-ramping toward it, but I hope that's very encouraging to you. And if you're in the chat, uh, one of the ways you can interact is, I'd love to know which, one of, which ones of you are art geeks, art nerds, or art fans. Like, how many of you are maybe art majors in college and no one knew it, or you love to draw and sketch or paint, or maybe you just love going to the Cleveland Museum of Art. I love going there. They got great food too, by the way. But man, it's so cool to go there. But today we're looking at a piece of art by this American artist whose name is Gary Melchers. Um, like pronounced Gary right here, like SpongeBob. And so Gary Melchers, and he's an American painter. Um, he was a native of Detroit, Michigan, and his father was a sculptor. So art ran in the family, apparently. And he also, in 1932, won a gold medal from the American Academy of Arts and Letters. Uh, so an award-winning artist also. And he was one of the leading American proponents of something called naturalism. Um, so there's different types of styles from naturalism and realism. And there's different things. You've heard of impressionism. So realism is really like he wanted his art to reflect or look like the real world. He wanted his art to look natural, typically. And so I think we'll see that a little bit in this painting that we're looking at today, simply entitled The Nativity. Um, you've seen it in the video before, the sermon here, as someone actually from Gary Melcher's home and now museum was going through in that video uh, on Facebook, just showing different paintings hanging up in his home and uh, this now museum where some of his paintings are at. And so this is The Nativity. And uh, for kids, students, adults, if you're interested, a way to interact right now is just to start to sketch this out and to try to make your own version to help you kind of engage with it and with the sermon. But this is a very unusual depiction of what you'd call the Holy Family, okay? Because there's no angels or shepherds, you notice. There's no wise men or donkeys or camels or sheep. Uh, surprisingly, there's no elves or Grinch or animated snowmen. There's none of that. It is just Joseph and Mary and her amazing child. And so they're all exhausted. And of course, you know, they're kind of the focus is all really on the Christ child. Now, Melchers chose to paint the trio really kind of alone in a darkened room and the color palette is monochrome just meaning shades of the same color and the 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 the, the tone is very somber um, so it's really a fascinating painting and i've grown to really love this the more i've looked at it and thought about it for this message but melchers chose to paint the scene which could be moments before the shepherds arrived or it could be after they left. Last week, my friend and mentor, um, Greg Nettle, talked about the shepherds, the possibly and probably children shepherds 
that showed up, and this could be before that or after that. Now, I tend to think it's after, and here's why. is because the angels appeared to the shepherds at night. Um, I've been to the fields where they would have kept their sheep, and it's you know just a couple miles away, just outside of Bethlehem. So I think if an angel appears to me, tells me the Savior has been born, I am boogieing there while it's still nighttime. And now you can see in the door that it's kind of dawn. So I picture this being after the shepherds have come and gone, nighttime's over, dawn light is starting to come through the door, and that's kind of the setting. That's open to you if you want to think it's before the shepherds came. Uh, We don't have to fight about it. We don't have to, but I do think the shepherds have gone already. And so there's kind of a sense here of respite, like of temporary relief, you know, between the scenes of what has happened with the birth, maybe the shepherds. And next will be the wise men that that certainly came later than the shepherds. They didn't overlap. That came later in Jesus' infancy, actually. And then Herod, trying to kill baby Jesus, gives a command to wipe out the babies in Bethlehem. So then they go on the run. So this is kind of a respite before the impending storm that's coming. Some rest between birth and then going on the run, being on the lamb, if you will, running from King Herod. Herod. And so I thought it was pretty cool that that tour guide, I'll just call her the tour guide at Gary Melcher's home and museum, said as she showed this painting, one that is the most requested reproduction that they get asked for in the, the shop. And then she says, what keeps our guests lingering so long before this picture? Like I love that she notes when people come here, they stop and they linger in front of this picture. And her response was, it's probably the spiritual quietude that the artist evokes. And I definitely agree with that. Like, take a look at this picture and just think of what this is depicting. A moment in history where God has chosen to enter into his creation. And these guys have heard this in advance, announced by separate angels on separate occasions. And now it has happened. And they are here and they're exhausted, but meditate on that. And as you look at the painting, drink that in what has happened here and what God has chosen to do in the history of mankind and let it give peace to your soul and remind you how much your creator, how much your heavenly father loves you, that this is the act of love, of grace, that you enter into the world for us. I want you to notice a few things about the painting. Because a lot of this is about examining and trying to understand what the, the artist may have been trying to communicate to us. So one thing is interesting is the door is open. Isn't that kind of interesting? Because you just picture the door is wide open. It's for anybody to walk past could just wander into this moment. Like the door is just open. And so maybe the shepherds were walking through Bethlehem trying to find and the door's open. And, and this is how they find them because the door's open. Or maybe... They left, and now they're just too exhausted to even get up and close the door. They're so exhausted. Uh, You know, and so this is all happening with this door barely hanging by its hinge, it looks like. You know, and the typical dignity and privacy, maybe this was so urgent that when they got here and the baby was about to be born, maybe the door was open during the entire birthing process, meaning there's not the regular dignity and privacy given to a mother And the husband, the child, in this situation, the door is open. Then Joseph. Joseph is so pensive. I think he could be looking at the baby, but to me it looks like his eyes are just, he's just kind of gazing and pondering and thinking right now. Just looking into space and, and clearly also tired. The tour guide in that video we saw earlier says, in Joseph's gaze, that's the wonder of every father who has witnessed the birth of a child. And so Joseph, you know, he, he was Mary's, Husband, they're, they're promised to be married here, but in that culture, once you were betrothed or engaged, you were called husband and wife. You just didn't consummate until after the marriage. So he's sitting there as, as Mary's husband and supporter. But also think about this. Joseph was just the midwife moments, minutes, hours ago. Like he's the first to touch the Christ child, the first to receive the Christ child, maybe the one who cut the umbilical cord. And so, man, he looks tired, you know, almost like he might go scoop up an air baby and just wander around in the stable. Like, he looks really, really fatigued. And so perhaps he's pondering the spiritual implications of what the angels have told them is that this is the Savior of the world, Emmanuel, 
God with us. And he's just thinking and trying to grasp like, but it's a real flesh and blood baby. This is so real. The naturalism, I think, brings that out in the painting. And then thirdly for right now, what we'll look at is, is, is Mary. I mean, she is bone weary, isn't she? She's dog tired, completely exhausted, entirely spent, totally depleted. The exhaustion of both parents is palpable. It's like you can feel it, you can touch it in the naturalism and the realism of this painting. And so now she's sleeping on a cold, hard floor. I love that her head is resting on Joseph. It's just this really sweet picture of how exhausted she is, and she's leaning on Joseph. And there's a recently used wash bowl and cloth next to where she's sleeping. And so, moms, I, I, I know, I've never given birth. I don't know if that will shock you, but I've never given birth. But it's always funny to me, having witnessed the process three times and talking to Shannon about the process, you know, many, many times afterward and all that, it's always funny when you see like a sitcom where on Friends or something, someone gives birth to a baby and she looks amazing. She's got makeup on, her hair's perfect. She pushes and grunts twice and boom, out comes a dry baby that looks like it's nine months old already outside the womb. You're like, man, that kid is way too big to have just been born and there's no fluids on that baby whatsoever. And so I love the naturalism in this painting. This is really like, man, this is what you kind of would picture. Maybe the room didn't look just like that. But the fatigue and what is happening afterward, and like the quiet moments of the fanfare maybe is over or about to begin, here is this quiet naturalism and realism. Melchers is trying to give us real talk through painting. So let's listen to the correlating scripture. Let's read that together. Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 1. It says, In those days, Caesar Augustus, the emperor of all of Rome, issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. He wants to know how many taxes should be coming in. He wants to make sure he can beef up his armies, take more territory. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. Then it says, And everyone went to their own town, to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea. 90 miles this trip is. And, and so they went to Bethlehem, the town of David, because Joseph belonged to the house and the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And so here's the story, summed up briefly, summed up beautifully, but of course, leaving out all the details and moments like this that may have happened of the naps needed afterward and the, 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 the tremendous tiring event of birthing a child. And then after that passage, it describes the shepherds seeing angels and then going to visit baby Jesus. But while painting this, just picture that Melchers is showing us moments where all this is after Mary has been through so much. Think of all she's been through. This is after nine months ago, an angel appeared to her. I mean, just think about the mental, spiritual, getting your mind around that. For days and weeks afterward, I saw an angel. Not many people see angels, messengers of God, but I saw an angel and trying to mentally process, the angel said, I will be giving birth to the Savior of the world, but I'm a virgin. Yes, but God has chosen you. And then after that, the anxiety of telling her parents, her Jewish parents, her traditional Jewish parents that she's engaged, but she's pregnant. And then after that, having to share that with Joseph and wondering that whole time, will she raise this child alone as a single mom? Because Joseph will say, wait a minute, you're pregnant? Like, how will that go down And the stress of that conversation? And, and how do I bring this up to Joseph? And after dealing with maybe the whispers and rumors around Nazareth during that nine months or while she was still in town, um, I mean, there seems to be hints big time in Scripture that there were rumors and whisperings about the whole Mary and Jesus story. 
And so dealing with all that going on surrounding her and then possibly awful morning sickness and then in the third trimester taking a trip 90 miles possibly on a donkey's back while having contractions, while beginning labor, maybe before arriving in Bethlehem. And then she gets in Bethlehem and they have, you know, it's giving birth out of town, possibly in a cave or a stable. I've been there. There's a lot of caves in the side of the hill in Nazareth that were former homes back in that time. So probably a cave-like situation and no epidural. I mean, this is all very realism, naturalism. And then maybe after hosting, child shepherds who show up and say, God sent us to come see the baby. So Mary is weary, bone tired. I mean, she, the last nine months and the last nine hours have been exhausting. She can barely lift her head to look at her child. She appears hungry and humble and dog tired. Now, let me give you in 30 seconds a big picture of Mary's journey here. It begins with this. Angel says, you're going to give birth to a savior Virgin Mary, and she responds in Luke 1 38, I don't understand this, but, but okay, I am the Lord's servant. If God wants me to do this, I will serve him. I'm the Lord's servant. You might say act two, you could, or point two of this, you could describe through what Melchers is trying to describe. This had to have been an exhausting nine months. And, and he tries to capture that and bring that out in his pain. This had to be exhausted. But point three is what it says later on in Luke chapter two. But after all this is said and done and while the shepherds are leaving, it says, but Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. So it was exhausting and crazy and surreal and ridiculous as this whole story is of God showing up in the flesh through you, Mary, and with your gigantic help, Joseph, she treasures this up and just feels this awesome reward of the moment and ponders it. Now, here's the deal. Christmas is awesome, right? But it's tiring. Like if you've ever hosted Christmas or made Christmas possible for a child, a nephew, a niece, anything, Christmas is awesome, but it's exhausting. It's tiring. Agreeing to be the Lord's servant is awesome, but it's tiring to say, God, uh, you probably have some plans for my life and I will serve whatever you want me to do. I will serve you in the marketplace, in the schools, in government, in the church, whatever it is. Uh, I will be the Lord's servant. Allowing God to bring something good into this world through you, to birth something beautiful, it is exhausting. It is absolutely physically wearing and tearing. You know, birthing a new church, that's one thing I can speak of. Being a part of a team, leading a team to start a church, it is exhausting. My memory exists in checkerboard fashion from the years of starting Momentum and even from launching this when it was the Twinsburg Macedonia campus, even from that era, and I played a different role in that area of coaching and encouraging and mentoring, and my memory looking back on those two eras of originally starting Momentum and then, you know, being a part of the start of this, like, I, man, there's things I just don't remember. Remember when we did this thing? No, that was when we launched the church. I don't remember that at all, man. It is exhausting trying to raise kids who love Jesus. Man, that is exhausting. And it takes so much investment. D despite, uh, during working on the hard work of communication with your spouse, to say, man, I want us to have a Jesus-centered, godly marriage but it's going to take hard work for us to communicate better about who we are, you know, what we want, what we feel like God's calling us to do, how we need to work together as a team. That's exhausting. You know, d disciplining yourself to chase after God daily through prayer, reading God's word, you know, through Sunday worship, those kinds of things through community and Mo group, that stuff can be so exhausting or finding ways to serve others during a pandemic, exhausting. Continue to pray for things that still haven't happened, exhausting. Waking up in the middle of the night to go fetch your air baby for your wife, exhausting. All those things are exhausting. I know when I go home on Sundays, I can barely make it when the Browns play at one o'clock. I can barely make it to the second quarter, the middle of it, 
because I am exhausted from Sunday morning as I know our other volunteers are. It is a sacrifice to say, I'll be the Lord's servant, I'll help out, I'll greet, I'll clean in between services, I'll do whatever, I'll run tech, I'll be in the band. It's exhausting. I usually fall asleep halfway through the second quarter, and I'm like, okay, I want to wake up at the end of halftime. Then I won't have missed anything but a half a quarter, but I got a good nap in, now it's on die stealers, you know, that kind of thing. And so, but it's so exhausting, and so I know it is exhausting to serve God in that way, as many of you know, Mo Group leaders, it's exhausting to lead and to shepherd a group of 10. It's exhausting just to show up and be shepherded and be in community, but to be the leader of it, man, that is so tiring to, to host a house church and mochurch.tv and say, we're going to invite our family over to worship with us, take communion together, just to host, even your family, exhausted. They already know where the bathroom's at. They already know where the cans of pop are at in the fridge. They totally know. Still, it's exhausting. So letting God use you for his purposes, submitting to his work, submitting to his will the way that Mary did, agreeing to be the Lord's servant is sometimes exhausting, just like it was for Mary, just like it was for Joseph. But here's such an encouraging passage. Galatians chapter 3 says this. It's a guy named Paul who, after Jesus was killed, he laid down his life on the cross, rose from the dead, this guy named Paul became a follower of Jesus and a great Christian leader, and he wrote this. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people. So see this, do good to all people. But then there's this extra priority on especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Like, especially your spiritual family, but love and serve and do good for all people. So Paul's saying, man, you're going to get weary. You're going to get physically exhausted. If you're going to be the Lord's servant, serving takes time, energy, effort. You will need naps. You'll be exhausted. You'll need rest. You'll need seasons of rest. You'll need celebration, all that stuff. But do not give up doing the Lord's work in your life, in the marketplace, in the schools, in the community, in the church. Do not give up. Up, and you will definitely get physically tired from it. But don't let yourself start daydreaming about being more comfortable, things being more convenient. If I stopped serving God, I'd have more time for this. It would be less stressful. Uh, I could hit the easy button. Don't give up doing the good things that God wants to accomplish, that God wants to accomplish through your life. In fact, the, the Greek word translated in that passage for give up uh, in classical Greek, it was used of when an archer was shooting an arrow and they were done, they would unstring their bow, which is funny because it's saying people can become unstrung also, right? Like you get so overwhelmed uh, emotionally, you can become unstrung, nervously unhinged, lose courage, lose confidence, lose strength and say, I'm unstrung, I'm done, I give up. And so Paul's saying, don't get weary, don't give up, don't become unstrung, keep doing good. Be encouraged because a harvest is coming. You will see the reward of the way that you have served God. One biblical commentator and scholar said, instead of looking for a place to quit, we should look for another place to start to serve. And so let me put it this way. It's natural to get tired from doing God's work, but it's disastrous to give up doing it. Don't become discouraged. Focus on there will be a harvest. There will be blessings that come from this. People will be impacted. I will grow through this. I will be encouraged. I will be more spiritually healthy. Mary and Joseph didn't give up on God's difficult mission for them, and they reaped a harvest because of it, and an entire world was blessed through it. And remember, Mary treasured up all these things in spite of the exhaustion she treasured up and pondered them in her heart. A few weeks ago, I was talking to a guy from Momentum named Izzy. His name's Israel. He goes by Izzy, too. And uh, early in the pandemic, when we were virtually, uh, virtual only, uh, he and a friend of his were baptized online. It was the first time we had like an all-virtual baptism during the pandemic, which was really cool. Uh, but I was talking to him. We were talking with some coffee at a park, socially distanced, of course. 
Um, and so we were talking at this park, and I shared something with him, and he was like, share that with momentum. That's super encouraging. I think the whole church needs to hear that. And it fits here just to say that I was thinking about the pandemic, and I started thinking this thought. Like, I have been so impressed by the resiliency of God's church globally during this pandemic. And what I mean by that is it can be discouraging to be like, man, churches temporarily or through this entire pandemic, some have been virtual only, and, and we've had, you know, a season early on, and then we did a couple of weeks at the end of November. And so that stuff can be discouraging, or, you know, I'm not seeing the people that I want to see necessarily. When I show up, there's people that I love. There's also people that I miss greatly. And there's all this discouraging stuff, but something that's encouraged me is the resiliency of the church. A pandemic, a global pandemic has hit us, and there are even churches who are 20 people, that are all over the age of 60, who have said, how do we pivot technologically to make sure that we can still get God's word out to people? And this has blown me away. Going through Facebook early in the pandemic and since, I have seen some old preacher sitting in his chair with a big old King James Bible that weighs 82 pounds and looking into Facebook Live that his grandchild probably set up for him, hitting the button and being like, okay, now pops, now, now, now. And they work their way through it. These are churches that would have never talked about doing virtual online church before the pandemic. But so many of these elderly, we got 20 people, 30 people, none of us feel safe going to the building right now, all that stuff. But we are still going to get God's word out to people. We're still going to do it through Facebook Live. And grandsons in front of the preacher, getting them going. And then at home, a picture of grandson coming over, help grandma and grandpa at home be able to watch the Facebook video, you know, whatever. What is the Facebook? Here, let me sign you in, you know, or whatever. What do you want your password to be? One, two, three, four. No, you can't do that. That kind of stuff. And so I've been so impressed by, honestly, the aging, elderly, decreasing, you know, kind of the, the churches that we feel like, oh man, they only have so much longer left if they don't read. But for the first time that I can think of, I've been like, man, those churches, I'm so proud of them. That is super cool because they just keep pivoting and saying the gospel will be preached. In spite of a pandemic, we will not grow weary in doing good. We won't give up. We'll get on technology we don't understand and Facebook Live. We will figure it out. It will be one angle and shaky at a weird crooked angle in the front row and we will still get the gospel out. The gates of Hades will not stop us. We won't quit. And I'm like, man, that is the resiliency that Paul is talking about in Galatians 6 and that we've seen from even aging and declining churches in America and around the world. Maybe for you, you have been kicked in the teeth by 2020 and maybe you've just been griping about it and you have allowed, hear me clearly, you have allowed 2020 to beat you into submission. Maybe you used to serve and I'm not just talking about it, momentum. I'm talking about in some way. Maybe you used to serve, but you just don't serve in any way. Maybe you're locked in a home to be safe with your family, but you don't serve people around you. You just don't serve, but you used to. Like maybe you used to pray for people who you felt like, man, Jesus would make an incredible difference in their lives, but now you don't. You know, maybe you used to worship, but now you don't. That's just so hard when it's online. It's so different not being there. So you don't worship. Don't give up. Maybe you used to celebrate. Now you don't. Maybe you used to be growing in your understanding of God's word, but now you don't. Maybe you used to be uh, encouraging kids and students, but now you don't. You haven't figured out how to pivot. Like even 80-year-old Christian preachers have learned to pivot, and you've got to learn to pivot. How are you going to encourage kids and students still in 2020? Do not give up doing good because you will reap a harvest of righteousness from that, helping people win. That's what we're all about spiritually. Uh, let me close with this. A couple of quick observations about the painting. One, focus on the Christ child. The, the main, brightest source of light in the room is Jesus. I think that's really cool. There's a little bit of dawn light coming in, but the thing's really interesting is there's a lantern behind the, the, the manger, there's a lantern behind it, but there's no light coming from the lantern. The source of light in the room is Jesus. I think that's really, really 
cool because it kind of harkens back to John chapter 1. By the way, that's the only time all year I've used the word harkens. Okay, I just want to throw that out there. But John chapter 1, it says, In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. And later on, Jesus, when he grows up and goes out preaching and teaching and performing miracles and talking to people about his heavenly Father, he says, I am the light of the world. And, and it says in Scripture that the light, the darkness couldn't even comprehend the light. Like this kind of love, this kind of teaching, all these things, Jesus is the light. And light is a metaphor for life and for hope and for guidance and direction, for vision and for sight and for victory over darkness. By the way, this is the perfect time of year. If 2020 has beat you into submission and you've stopped reading God's word or you never have and it's time to start, this is the perfect time to start reading Matthew 1 or Luke 1, the Gospels. One of those because they begin with the Christmas story. It be, it's a perfect time to begin reading through the Gospels and then you get to the life and teachings of Jesus, the cross of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus eventually. And you've got some extra time off probably in the next couple of weeks to begin that spiritual journey or that spiritual discipline. And the other thing is just to go back to this in light of the fact that Jesus is the light, the main source of light in the room. Just remember the doors open. And what I picture from Gary Melcher's is simply this, that is an invitation. That is to say anyone who might happen to show up at the right place at the right time could be welcome to come in and see Jesus, the light of the world, the truth, the one that brings life and that brings hope and that gives sight and vision and guidance and that defeats darkness, that anyone, if you happen to be led by, might just happen to be in the right place at the right time. And this is an invitation to say, come and see the Christ child and learn what he's all about and what God is saying about his love for mankind through this baby. Let's pray.